to the Institute for Democratic Governance, IDEG, which is organizing the 2021 Ghana Speaks Lecture Series. It's on the topic, Reconstructing Local Governance and Multi-Party Democracy in the Fourth Republic Proposals. Uh, let me take you there now. Dr. Emmanuel Akwete, who is Executive Director of IDEG, is currently speaking. Honourable, welcome. Thank you. So, um, the space in local government for political parties is extremely important. And when you look at all democracies, um, with liberal uh, democracies and with different parties, socialists, uh, climate parties like the Green parties and so on, Germany, UK, you go to the US, you go to Canada and so on, political parties are not prohibited from participating in local government and taking leadership. In some places, it will be clear that anybody can contest election. And wherever political parties contest elections, individuals can also stand. It's guaranteed space. So you have to sometimes, there are parties that would rather together, come together and put up an individual candidate whom they think is very good. But political parties are development agents as well. And you need to create the space, you need to recognize their rights, legal and so on, so that they can deliver this. But that hasn't happened in Ghana. And it might surprise many of you. So if you look at the Fourth Republic, although the assembly system had been established, you know that it was not a party system from 82 to 1992 when the constitution came. And then, it was incorporated in the Constitution. And I learned from my readings and talking to people involved that there was some need for consensus amongst the elites, those who like pol political parties, they call themselves the Democrats or liberal Democrats. And there were the revolutionaries who also felt that multi-party was so divisive and corrupt and so on and that there was the need to take care of development first. So which one comes first? Is it your civil and political liberties, the freedoms that are identified, or is it, you know, your needs? You know, what you need, the good food, the good health, housing, education, and so on. Somehow, the compromise that was forged reflected in the design of the executive arm of government, so that you would see that in the Fourth Republic, the president is elected on multi-party basis. Everybody is involved, whether you are a revolutionary or you are a liberal political person or whatever. And we see it in the parties. And they can contest parliamentary elections as well. <clears throat> and you could see how in close to 28 years, or you've seen how the parties get the majority, and the, the party whose candidate wins the presidential invariably got the parliamentary majority. So we had majority parties and their president governing. That is how the system has evolved. Until the last election, where we have a different situation, and everybody talks about hang parliament, hang because this is something new, you know, and, and, and then this negative part that they are going to sabotage each other rather than work together also became one of the, the discussions. But we've also learned a lesson that um, when you put parties together in a situation where there are power relationships or they feel they could only get things done when they work together, they are also capable of doing that. But in all these situations, there are rules and regulations clearly laid out because the business of the state is law. And most of the time where there is no law, the state has a different way of approaching it. Either a law will be made, or they will see which one to be applied. So you just can't do just anything when you're dealing with issues of the state. Um, initially, it worked fine that we said MMDCEs and members of local assemblies will be elected on no party basis, and you know the president would appoint 30% of those in the assemblies, but in the MMDCs, um, he would appoint individuals. Um, but now we know that 
For a while, it worked. That was the situation. Until certain changes occurred in our political architecture. If you look at representation in parliament, until 2012, you still would have one of the parties, we call them minorities outside parliament. <laughs> you know, because the big opposition party is referred to as a minority in parliament. And when we call our parties small parties or smaller parties and so on, um, they don't take it easy. <laughs> they find it and And we think about it too and say, look, could we have other names of calling them as political parties? Okay. Um, but what we see is that initially nobody was making demands for part party, uh, for, for uh, local government, something to be done about local government. But around 2000, people started saying, hey, you are not delivering. That was the NDC from 1993 to 2001. Uh, we are not satisfied with the public service delivery, the water, the sanitation, the health, education. Look at the grades our children are. There are no jobs here, and where's the economy, and all that. And civil society groups started engaging on these issues, especially those working in the development arena, and pointed out that it is very important that the people who are governed by assemblies and chief executives elect their leaders so that they can hold them accountable, a way of putting pressure on them and making sure that they serve their needs. So this was the demand. I think it became popular for the MPP to put it in its manifesto. Uh, it won the election and the demand was still there. The NDC responded to somehow, but I can tell you that somewhere along the line there was cold feet of this reform because there was this notion that we are not sufficiently unif unified, the cohesion between us, and that there are some negative forces who could create problem if we decide to elect locally, you know, chief executives, and, and that could create more problems because there were some sessionist uh, tendencies and all that. So that came to pass. But the demand continued. It was captured in the uh, African peer review, Ghana African peer review mechanism report, that this was an important reform. The response that came that was more definite happened about 16 years after the uh, advocacy. And that was in 2016, where you found that now parties have put it in their manifesto. Uh, the big parties, MPP, NDC, and they all had some different <laughs> approaches, but they were going to pursue this if elected. In 2016 context, when this was done, there have been some significant developments in our political environment. It wasn't like from 1992 to 2001. It wasn't like from 2001 to, let's say, 2004 we suddenly realized that our two dominant parties were growing in number almost at par, and their politics became very election-centric too, retaining power. Um, I think nobody wants four, term, <laughs> four years, only four years in, in power, so they all wanted a lot. But the interesting thing that happened is that we began to see that two parties one that went into a position in 2021 and the, the other that came, that was MPP and so on, were able to also build their strength, their membership, the organizational capacity, and their spread throughout uh, the country and the constituencies. And it became more obvious that because of the design of the local government system, after elections, it's only the governing party that has business to do on development. And the governing party appoints all the MMDCs from its party. They don't carry the name um, MPP and so on, but they appoint. And then in the assembly, 70% elected, the assumption that was made 
or the precondition for that system was that the Electoral Commission with state funds would mount platforms for individual candidates who would be shortlisted. It was quite an elaborate process and unwieldy. So parties are not going to finance them because parties were prohibited. And they who go into the assembly will be representing their constituencies, those who put them out. This was the system. I think they both agreed. But we also saw that within a relatively short period, um, the EC could not handle this. The expense was not there. The money was not there. I remember that some NGOs, including us at one time, were asked if we can also uh, maybe set up platforms and so on. So the feasibility of the idea that you could have non-parties, individuals coming to represent their con communities and the state will finance their campaign one way or the other was problematic. Secondly, there wasn't any firm regulatory framework of how do you raise funds and how do you account for them? Who finances you? The framework wasn't that strong. And so you also got into a situation where the need for money meant they would also look at where they could get the funds. And you know who uh, enthusiastically then gets involved? It was more the two powerful parties than uh, the uh, smaller or minority parties. So the financing of individuals, although they were individuals, it didn't take long for us to hear from the two parties that, oh, um, <laughs> we are in control of that assembly. The presiding officer, you know, it's, it's our person and so on. And those who thought this was a joke, I think the recent development where we saw that oh, a group came together out openly in the Cape Coast in the endorsement of the president's nominees for MMDCs, and they were, well, is the press that reported it, I haven't done my work to know it's true, but they were NDC assembly members who said, well, we were given money to vote for and endorse, but we didn't and we are returning the money. I think we've had a few instances somewhere. So the fundamental question we ask ourselves is that 28 years on after the system was established, what has it become? Have we really made it the nonpartisan assembly system? Have we succeeded in making it the nonpartisan or individuals who are MMDCs or we have failed? It is long enough and that evidence is extremely important, tells you whether this system can take us far or not. When you come to the assemblies, we also saw in the same process of nomination. I mean, it was very interesting the way they published the processes. But you could also see that in the nomination of MMDCs, um, uh, uh, candidates for, for confirmation, the governing party was actively involved. And it makes sense that they want to know those they can work with to deliver their programs in four years. And yet, we have a rule that says, no, um, don't show your party identity so much. So when we did the analysis, our interpretation was that actually the executive arm of government, the way it was set up, shows that the party in government, who the president and his governing party, actually have monopoly over local government. And so they can appoint MMDCs, they can do other things for MMDCs to go into assemblies. The 30% appointments that should have gone to non-state actors, civil society, and so on, chiefs represented, all those groups have complained that they were not consulted, but they got in. So the system we have now is one that says that the executive arm of government, the president is elected popularly, directly by everyone, the members of assemblies come from, uh, uh, from uh, members of parliament come from constituencies. And those who choose to be their cabinet, you know the majority must come from parliament, are party people. But 
in local government, which is the president's mechanism, okay, machinery for delivering his products, we evolve a system that is informally party driven. Formally, it is not. But informally, the governing party and the president have monopoly, control local government. And I think it's one of the consensus that you'll be told, I don't know those who negotiated it, was agreed in the transition to the Second Republic. So there would be no party systems there. Now, if you put that system together, it means that we have a certain phobia for parties getting into local government and from 1964. But it has consequence. So what kind of parties do we then produce? They do elections in the hope that there will be MPs and, and uh, presidents. But they are not in local government to even think about the public policies that they will pursue and the realities that will help them pursue to bring about transformation. So this is a system. The um, opposition party that grew, that has so much power, like the NDC in opposition now, when they've left, when they leave uh, government, they don't lose their power and influence <laughs> on the structures, particularly on the assemblies. So when the elections come, um, they, could, they become sponsors, they know their people, and sometimes they brag about it. Oh, it's our man who is there, and so on and so forth. So let us not, let us disabuse our minds that we've ever had a system where the parties are completely out in the local government. It is just that one party controls it. But a bigger party, also with that strength, that governed and was in opposition or had gone into opposition, also is in there. That's how you see the NDC, MPP, whether they are returning money or, <laughs> or not doing that. The third point I wish to make is that in the way we've seen the parties really boldly get into local government, assembly elections and so on, and nothing happens to them. You see, I would imagine that if it had been, uh, let's say, a European country, um, those who said, we are NDC, we are in this assembly, Cape Coast, we came to endorse, they gave us money, the law enforces will go in. Because the law says you can't participate in this. And then you say, oh, I am actually here. And then you got a bribe. You know the giver and recipient of a bribe, they are all guilty. So again, you see that nothing happened across. So the system has no serious rule of law around it. And then we see a lot of weakness and chaos and so on. But this is the system we are living with close to 30 years of the 1992 Constitution. You would ask yourself, with this kind of politics, what capacity does it have to deliver transformational development, economic development, in the next uh, 30 years? But everybody sees 30 years as a period in which you should have uh, this kind of transformation. Now, the more scary case is this. Since the 2008 elections, or in the 2000, we've seen how fierce the competition between the two parties, the MPP and the NDC, are. We use the term, they are dominant parties. One of them is minority in opposition, but is a very powerful minority. But we also use the term, they are duopolis. You see, they have so much power, and they can do whatever. If you see the campaigns, like, you know, break eight, we also see that break eight is practiced on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody, where is the state institution that says, hey, or the law that you violate, if you would not have an electoral season or cycle, or you know that after elections there is something else you have to do, there's a period for elections and there's a period for devoting your time so that annually you can tell us your policy programs and so on and so forth. We don't have that. So there is actually no conducive legal framework or an enabling the preconditions that must be created for them to be busy after elections and be able to say we are serving our people because you still have people in parliament and in the constituencies that I voted for. You do not have that law. Nobody can stop them. Nobody can enforce them. But, but you know, Duopolis, 
in the economic setting because they have the potential to act in ways that could undermine the economy and create so many problems. There are institutions that deal with them. Securities and Exchange Commission, you saw how they de dealt with men's gold. You saw the Bank of Ghana and how it dealt with banks that were, they say, hey, you are threatening the financial stability of the country and we have to intervene. So our parties, probably we did not anticipate that they would grow so rapidly. But these are giants and there's no, no entity in the state that has the legal mandate to say parties, hey, what you're doing is not good. This violence and so on, so let's do something about it. So in, 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 a, in, 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 in a nutshell, we now live in a situation where our parties have come of age. The competition is fierce, it's violent, we are scared, and yet we come out in numbers, we spend a lot of money, we have election security task force, we have the army involved, we have police telling us they can't deal with the vigilantes and the violence that would ensue and so on. But this is an aberration of what you would call the democratic system, the multi-party democratic system, because it's a system of rule of law and violence is not tolerated. They would engage you, they would arrest, they would prosecute. Even overspending in elections, just last week we heard that the Chancellor of Austria who is like prime minister, has been forced to re uh, resign, is now leader of their party in their parliament, because he spent money on his PR during the campaign, and the police are saying that was taxpayers' money. So they are investigating him. He's denied, but he has to step down. We've also heard about President Sarkozy, how they said, hey, you spent twice the amount you should have spent. So you see, they even have levels, and we hear a lot about monetization in the system. Who, who spends and who finances? The state is nowhere to be seen on these matters. But where we've got into, for some reason, these same parties, giants of parties, have in the last five years, since 2016, also shown some seriousness about dealing with parties and their behavior and, you know, um, and, and how that could, should be considered also seriously. The election bit came up that we would elect. The NDC said, yes, we would elect. And they were looking at how to do that because the CRC did actually put it out that, yes, people want to elect and conditions should be created for them to elect the IMMDCs. How do you do that in this context where very powerful political parties and the rise of these powerful political parties has also diminished the power and visibility of the smaller parties? Do we see them in parliament? No, but not only that, even in, in the interval between elections, we are seeing that our multi-party democracy just can only take two parties and they are their, their battle is fierce, whether it's transition, whether it's whatever, there is violence and there is some, you know. So we have looked at all this and it struck us that the proposals on the table for reforming table, uh, uh, local government are so important, it might help us turn the system around. Um, the election of MMDC is fine, but and in the, the current government, in its first term, also came with the idea that, okay, we said we would elect MMDCs within 24 months of our first tenure. But the pre president said, look, there are impediments to that election. He didn't elaborate them, but if you read the State of the Nation, he says, so to clear the impediments, okay, to the elections, we must amend another article. And that is the article that formally prohibits political parties from participating in local elections, and for that matter, assembly elections and, and government, local government. We must first do that. And he wanted that to be done first, whatever it is. At one time, we had the two parties actually working on that. The NDC was in favor of that, even supported it when the parliamentary debate took place. 
the sequence. They wanted this to be amended very first, you know, amended so we clear the way and then we can have the selections. Then whatever happened, happened. We couldn't have that, those uh, <laughs> uh, uh, reforms. The referendum had to be cancelled. And then once it was cancelled, the president has decided that for him, the two articles go together. It cannot be only one. But the NDC said, oh, we can do one. Let us negotiate the consensus on how you do 55-3. <laughs> but that can be done later. The president said, no. Um, we should do it together. But there wasn't much time because we knew 2020 election was coming and so on and so forth. There was also the local government elections that had to be separated from the referendum. So where we stand now then after that election, both of them said they would put back the proposal to reform local government. Now, the other thing pushing the parties is that the people in the districts are complaining. We are not seeing the development. Our living conditions are poor. Education is not good, road sanitation, and if you look at it that this system was put in place in 1988 and incorporated and all that, uh, there's some disenchantment. And already we know that voting in local assembly elections, the turnout is not as high. It's, 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 it's very low, around 30%, 34 and so on and so forth. So the questions are there. People are beginning to see that, hmm, uh, people are disenchanted with the parties. And then when the question was posed about MMDCs, they said, ah, we can elect, but we don't want parties involved. And you know, CDD, uh, Ghana's post-election survey, I think they published it two weeks ago, shows clearly that 76% out of 72 or 74 who said, we will vote uh, our MMDCs. We don't want them to appoint. Then 76% said, but we don't want parties. And if you listen to the debate leading to the cancellation of the referendum, that's what many people were saying. Yet we are a multi-party democracy. And parties, their presence guarantees our civil and political rights. For civil society, if the parties are not in place, you can't exist. When the army comes and they are governing, there's nothing like civil society. You can talk by heart and question them and expose media. Be very careful. You can't expose things by heart. You get into trouble. It surprised me that I have staff who have never lived under military rule. So they just couldn't understand what I was telling them about the importance of civil and political rights under constitutionally guaranteed systems. So going forward, we've gone through the election. And frankly, True to what they said, both parties have put back the local government reform. They are interesting proposals. For the NPP, they have now promised three things, and it was still there, but I think it's more coherently articulated in their manifesto, and the president has been speaking about it. We've been to the ministry, the CDD Ghana, and asked to talk to them, and they say, no, we want to do this. Now, the first one is that they still want to elect MMDCs, but they want to do it by clearing the impediments so that parties can participate. And then they want to devolve more money. They want to devolve. They didn't say they would delegate. You know, they are aiming to the highest level of resource sharing, the national revenue. They haven't given the participation, but they said the regions, the districts, the local communities. So this is what they want to achieve. And they want to do it possibly within this term of their mandate. Some people say, when I talk to them about this, said, ah, MPP crowd, are they serious? Look, the break aid seems to be everything for them. Every time, that's what you read. They are not even talking about the proposals. And we say to them that, look, as civil society, as policy research think tanks, we do policy, we advocate what has to do, and we try to bring, call, draw their attention and also push them. So every citizen should tell them, hey, these are the important reforms that you said you do. We want to see it. The NDC says they will still do MMDC election without parties, but they will also try to, okay, they will also try to, um, they, they are also interested in implementing some of the recommendations of the, um, of the CRC, the Constitution Review Commission, and they would Look at, look at that, but they did not specify exactly what. 
If you put these two proposals together because they are the giants, the big parties, and we vote for them and all that, you would find that if they can find a common ground to agree that they are going to do it, I think because all of them agree on 2431, the election of MMPCs, um, it's not an issue you should even worry about because it's agreed. But the parties coming in, would they, there's serious difference there. Although N NDC also gave some preconditions in November 2019 under which they would do, they would agree. But the process for doing that, we are not sure if that has started. The reason why we think that these reforms would help us, and it is important to proceed on them, to bring some changes in the structure of the executive domain of, gov of government, is that if indeed political parties, they agree that political parties should go into local government, the first thing is not to rush parties into elections, but they are going to reform the system. They, are going to, they will have to create what is called the enabling conditions for the parties to. So the problems we are having with the parties, the monetization, the, uh, you know, the accounting for who finances them and so on, will be important. The behavior of the parties and why small parties cannot grow and so on, those conditions would have to be seen to. The state would have to find an institution backed by law that now, in addition to the Electoral Commission, will deal with parties on issues other than elections. In other countries, the police has so much power to regulate the parties on their finances. And no compromise, whether you're prime minister or president, people have had to leave office because they really scrutinize where you got your money and who paid you and so on. But getting parties into local government will be historic. But that is also where our parties are now going to develop their capacity to lead transformational development. This is reform that if it happens, probably we are going to see competition in public service delivery. We are going to see the end of winner takes all. We are going to see different parties working with the president, <laughs> who may not necessarily be their party candidate, but institutions would have to be created and strengthened to mediate that, intermediate that relationship. And the focus on development will be much stronger. So it is a huge opportunity, but it will transform. You are going to see executive in Ghana now being a place where you see MPP, NDC, uh, PNC, CPP, and other parties, maybe holding mayoral positions or chief executive positions with some members in the assemblies and so on. But the rule of law is there. So if you collected bribe, the police probably would not be empowered to pick you up. Bribery is not part of what elections, democratic elections should do. So we need to correct all these things before anybody, we open the doors to the parties to go in. And in doing that, we are actually going to also strengthen the developmental orientation of our parties and their delivery. And so they would also come under the law, and they know that they are not above the law. This is an extremely important reform. And once parties have to go in, we have to restructure the system. Institutions have to come that can deal, call the parties to attention. They can even call the president to attention, like we've seen in, in uh, uh, um, uh, Austria and other France and other places. We are at that stage now. The next 30 years could be the period that we begin to see strong development dividends because the competition will shift from elections to making sure that in your district, uh, sanitation is good and water, good drinking water is there, but education grades are high because you are investing in the children and the equipment they need, the facilities, and so they will compete over it. They will even compete over the economic development, and cooperate, collaborate as well. And if the evolution comes, we are also going to get more money going in and so on. So we have to put pressure on our leaders for this to happen. Parties cannot get into local government without restructuring the system. Because the evidence is the parties are there, MPP, NDC. The evidence is our small parties 
are not doing well, and no party survives. And that is not good for the system. We need to build conditions that would also like parties to grow. That's why in the private sector, they always talk about enabling conditions for SMEs because of their contribution to the economy, employment, and so on, grow them so they will grow the economy. We need to also apply that idea to this. So the proposals that I put forward, I think my panelists would, would, would take up, is that electoral commission does elections, but parties also do development. They are nation builders. They see to our unity and all that, and we need an institution that is state, backed by law and with certain powers that can call the parties to order. And those kinds of institutions can be created. For example, the NDC is talking about electoral uh, regulatory authority, isn't it? A regulatory authority they are proposing that would regulate the political parties. We think that there must be a multi-party democracy commission that will see to developing our democracy and creating conditions for the parties to be different from what they are now in the next 30 years. They must champion our development and the transformation and win the youth over. They must have resources to recruit the youth and train them, not in violence, but the competencies they need to be future leaders. So there is a very important work to be done, and I believe they can do it, but the framework must be there, and it should not only be private financing. Uh, uh, private financing. Finally, my point that I'll leave with, with the restructuring is that the state is bigger than the parties. And if we are going to have parties working together, the public service, the civil service, are institutions of the state. And they are institutions that would mediate the relationship between different parties at local level and at the national level. And we need to strengthen them also. And they become the institutions that the president who is working with CPP, PNC, NDC people, and so on, or, the, or vice versa, they will work through that bureaucracy, it's depoliticized, it looks at efficiency and how to deliver, and there are various groups. Finally, finally, this is my final one. NDPC, we all, when you look at CRC, NDPC was one of the important, in fact, the most popular institution people wanted. They want long-term development and how it grows, it continues to transform education, health, housing, and all that. NDPC is also the monitoring and evaluation institution of the state. NDC does our long-term plan, and they are producing four-year plans. Our parties have never had agreements on NDPC and its plans. So today, NDC does that thing. We change government, and we are not pursuing it. We have a different plan. And there's a lot of corruption in local government, according to the Auditor General's report that we see. And so there is a, a chance that we could strengthen these institutions and make sure that, you know, the civil service is really a service delivery institution that is not politicized or partisan and so on, but will recognize our identities as citizens and the rights we're entitled to. And if we can get this done, you would see that the NDPC, probably at the regional level, will be monitoring and evaluating. What are you using the money for? We'll not be told they spend billions, but we can't find the projects. So we have all the uh, tools that will change the system, except that the, our parties and ourselves as voters ought to come to a certain agreement that these are things we must strengthen and reposition to ensure that in the next 30 years, we, are, we have parties, but not uh, at the cost of our development and our well-being, because institutions of state would ensure that they are doing the right thing. I'll stop it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Akwete. This is the Ghana Speaks Lecture Series coming to you live from Idega at East Legon. I actually underestimated your interest in this topic, because when I was asking him, oh, you have 30 minutes to speak. So I will just give some quick remarks for 20 minutes. Charlie, the man, <laughs> this is like your, your, this is your baby. If I left you one hour, you'd have still gone. You would just keep going. Okay. The problem I have is that we have uh, two hours for the whole program, and one hour is already gone. 
So I'm going to have to change the plan, and please bear with me. So we have four panelists. We give each of them 15 minutes. If I give them 15 minutes, it means 7 o'clock, we'll just give the closing prayer and go home. So what I want to propose is I'm going to give each of them a question. I think the key questions in the athematic area. Luckily, we have mics where you are. You just share your thoughts while you are sat there. Then we can bring everybody in because we have a very rich audience here. I can see Honorable Obi Amwa here. I can see Kojo Asante CDD. I can see YB. So quite a number of people. I see uh, uh, our friend from EU and things. So if you would agree, there are four thematic areas for the, <clears throat> for the discussion. So uh, Professor Koshiga, your, your area essentially is the nexus between CRC proposals and local government reforms. And Doc has given us some ideas about the possible tensions between the two leading political parties and their positions. So maybe my question to you would be, in reading the CRC report and what they also said about local governance, do you see any opportunities for consensus? Because I think the purpose of this is to see where we agree. Then we can deal with where there are issues. So if you look at what the CRC said, if you think through what the MPP wants to do, what the NDC have said, and what CDD have also put together, can you help us from a legal perspective with what you think are the quick wins and then one or two potential areas of challenges where you think we need to think through? So maybe you can, you can do that while you sit down, because when people stand, they talk more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you will sit and do that for me. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's also because the, the camera meant to prefer a wider shot, because we're on Facebook, we want to interact. Okay. So you will sit on your voice. <laughs> you won't stand at all. So put your hands together for Prof. Uh -huh. So I hope the question is clear. Fantastic. So let, let's take your comments on that. Thank you very much. And, uh, Yes, indeed. Uh, Doc asked the questions. Uh, how far can the president of this country Is it sustainable? The answer, obviously, is no. And if you watched the news yesterday, you could see frustration in the face of the president when he was commenting on the manner in which the confirmation of the MMDCs is going on right now. Mm -hmm. You could see it clearly. And he made it clear that he would want to see a change in the system, a change towards elections. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I am concerned, there is actually no difference in the position of the two parties. Mm -hmm. And also all of us, mm. we are just afraid of certain consequences. Consequences, perhaps the major one for uh, many of the citizens is, yes, we want to bring in elections at the local levels. Mm -hmm. But are we not just transferring the problems of the parties we can see at the national level, mm -hmm. the corruption in governance at the national level to the local level, those are well-founded fears. Mm -hmm. You can't run away from them. Mm -hmm. But the fact also remains that, yes, there is need for reform. Mm -hmm. We need, we have come far where we cannot leave out the parties mm -hmm. at the local level. Mm -hmm. It's clear. We'll be fooling ourselves to think mm -hmm. that they are not there. They are there. Mm -hmm. So what are we uh, running away from? Mm -hmm. What we need to do, and Doc has uh, emphasized that a lot, are strong institutions. Mm -hmm. It should not be as if that we can just get into uh, governance at a local level, and then you are free to do what you like. We need the institutions. We need strong and if you look at the CRC report, mm -hmm. some of these institutions were mentioned, for instance, in the NDPC. Mm -hmm. The importance of the NDPC, not at the national level only, but at the local levels is uh, emphasized. Uh, the, the common uh, fund, 
We need institutions that will ensure that it actually works. We've been hearing stories of the fund not being released to the assemblies on time. Mm -hmm. That can only happen under a system where the president or the executive appoints them. Mm -hmm. If it were to be under a system where they were elected and a district assembly or a DC would not hesitate mm. to take on the executive if the fund is not released. Okay. But under the current system, you dare not mm -hmm. because you were appointed by the same person mm -hmm. that you'll be challenging. So I don't see a difference in the position of the various parties. It is just that we have certain apprehensions. Apprehensions that are making some of us think that, well, let us allow elections, but without parties. Mm -hmm. But others are thinking that, no, let us go the full hog. But mm -hmm. if we have the strong institutions that will make sure that things work, that introducing the parties into the local level would not just mean business as usual. Mm -hmm. That there should be accountability. The office of the Auditor General should be strong enough to get into what happens at the mm. local levels. And those who need to be punished are punished. Mm -hmm. If we can do that, then those fears should be Fantastic. Uh, put aside. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You. So what I will do now is to proceed to my next discussant and frame it as a question. So you don't need to read your notes because I feel we've, we've moved. My question to you, your thematic area, uh, Madam Hamida, and by the way, she is from Abantu for Development. She is the Mobilization and Sustainability Manager. So your area is balanced gender representation for effective local government reform. If we were to go by what has been said so far, mm. open the floodgates for partisan elections at the local level, it's your instinct that it will enhance gender representation or it will hamper it. Now, the, the basis for the question is that there's a 30% already that on paper we are supposed to give to different groups. It appears we are not doing that, okay? Also, we look at elections in Ghana and we know that generally at the end of the elections, the gender representation is bad, although we recognize that the affirmative law that's coming will give the political parties more like the impetus to balance it in their primaries. So what are your reflections on what this will do for gender representation for effective local governments? There's a mic next to you somewhere. Please make sure it's working. And while we are at it, we are live on multiple platforms. We are on City, we are on Joy, we are on Atinka, we are on GBC nationwide. Send your questions in the stream. So I need a technical guy to work on the mic. That's why I'm talking a lot. So please hurry up. Make sure all the mics are on. It's still not on, please help me. And those of you in the audience, I, I will be coming to you shortly with your thoughts on this. So we're dealing with the CRC, we deal with the gender dimension, we deal with the issue of multi-party uh, and minority parties and then inclusion. So Madam, please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Bernard. And I think that uh, if we look at the national level mm -hmm. where political parties are functioning, mm -hmm. the position of women have not been better. So we are also inclined to think that the position of women within the local government system, if political parties are allowed openly, mm -hmm. because right now they do function, whether women will have a better opportunity for voice. Mm -hmm. The issue here is the fact that you have talked of the 30% mm -hmm. appointment. There is a administrative directive that has existed requiring that this 30%, 30% of it should be allocated to women. 
and that has never happened. Mm -hmm. there, it has never happened in the history of the existence of the local governments. So we are inclined to think that unless whether there is political party participation within the local governments or not, there must be a law mm -hmm. that will mandate the state or the actors within this system to make sure that women's representation is guaranteed. Mm. And the issue of representation of women within the local government system has been woeful. Because right now, as we speak, women representation in the local government is only 5%. Out of over 6,000 seats, electoral seats, there is only, only 220 women were elected in the 2019 local government elections, representing 5%. But we live in a country which is mandated through its agreement in international, regional, and even our constitution, mm. that there must be equal representation. And actually, the objective of the district assembly system or the local government system is to promote mass participation. That women. Since 1998, I think the highest number of women elected into this assembly was about mm -hmm. 478. Okay. So here we are looking to advocate for the passage of the affirmative action mm. law in Ghana. Mm. 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 That will provide a, a guaranteed percentage mm. of representation. Ghana now has a draft bill, mm -hmm. and this draft bill, I think the progress of this bill has been very slow. And we are hoping that once it is presented to parliament and it is passed, at least it will guarantee about 40% women's representation. And that's what is required in this mm. bill. Mm. So if I get you right, if we just allow the political parties without this bill, it will probably even worsen the gender issue. But if the bill is passed and accepted, yes. then we can move from the paltry 5% to 40%. Exactly. So that's the only precondition you have. Affirmative action bill becomes law. Parties agree to use it. Then we are in business. Not party agrees. Parties forced. Are forced. <laughs> yes. Are forced. Because it's a law. Okay. It's a law. <laughs> yes. Parties are forced. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that's great. Thank you. We'll pause here. Let me come to um, Nanaya Achimpim Jantua. So again, pardon me. I know you have your prepared speech. I want to frame it for time's sake. So your thematic area is strengthening minority parties for multi-party local governance. He's already explained why we use the word minority party. I hope it's not offensive. My first, my question to you is. The first election I consciously followed was the election that Liman took part in. I think I was in JSS. So I was born in a military time. <laughs> and that election, I think Liman got 10% or something. He did very well. He didn't get that. He wasn't that bad. I think that was one of, it was the third part or whatever. Now, when we calculate the thing, the line for the non NDC MPP is come down. It's almost zero, so probably like 2%. So again, the same preamble. If we allow political parties into the local governance space, would it help non-NDC MPP, or would it further, it will make your funeral announcement as in the end of everything? What are your, your, your reflections on that? Hi, hi. Thank you very much. Um, you see, to be described as diminutive, in itself is a challenge. Mm. Um, you are a minority and the way it is, you cannot progress vertically to get power. And when I got here, you yourself made it clear that it is difficult for everybody to recognize in a space that we are around. When you are introducing everybody, 
you said, and other um, organizations. But I was sitting here at CPP, you didn't recognize me. Oh. So minority. <laughs> So the issue of my the, the, the connotation, I was expecting you to say that the CPP is also here. If MPP oh. was sitting here or NDC, you immediately say, oh, there's a representative from NDC. I thought I said regional then, secretary of CPP. Yes. yes. You didn't say anything. You just said, oh, and other social and uh, CSOs. So that in itself. I'm part of the problem. <laughs> That in itself Forgive shows me. that it is difficult for recognition. It is difficult mm. for us to be in the space. Mm. I do agree with you that if we are allowed to take part in local government, it will also help us in representation. Mm -hmm. It will also help us in the discourse in the multi-party democracy. But that does not mean that we shouldn't strive to be in parliament. We should strive to also be part of the legislature to make our voices heard. We are the CPP and other minority parties. Some, there are some of our members who are the assembly. Mm -hmm. But the sad thing is that if they, they ever went there because they were CPP, they wouldn't have won. Okay. Because, for instance, we have people in Ashanti region in the assembly, they had to use the MPP colors mm. or some semblance of red and something to show that they are not from another party. It is important that we are out there, but the challenges are a lot. I do believe that if government is able to give a quota, especially when it comes to the of nomination and appointment of MMDC, because that one is within the bosom of government. Mm -hmm. To have a broader stakeholder consultation amongst political parties, other political parties, and also try and nominate some of us to the local level. I think it will be very good, because already it is partisan. I remember when I was watching um, is it Mrs. Saki for Greater Accra, when they were voting for her. I was happy as a woman. I was happy that she got 100%. Very fine person. Mm -hmm. But one thing struck me. There were two groups divided there. One in green, which they said represented NDC, and one in white, which they said represented MPP. Mm -hmm. So partisanship is at that level. But to promote for other parties to be there so that it is not always the geopoly, there is the need for government to make an effort mm -hmm to include us. Okay. Because when Doc was talking, he was talking about the Electoral Commission used to finance them to have their platforms to speak and all. This time you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. The onus is on the party or the onus is on the person to look for funds to campaign. Mm. And knowing that we don't have that power, that financial wherewithal, to be able to help our people, it is a big challenge. Because to even go day by day, it's not easy. So I believe that government should make an effort to deepen democracy at the grassroots level, mm -hmm. to decentralize our politics, even to decentralize decision making, so that other parties will also be part of it. Because after all, they are already in the districts, and they are also development agents. Mm -hmm. And it will also be a way that we can also speak. Because even when it comes to the media, the media does not even give space to minority parties. Put on your TV in the morning. It is NDC, MPP. We don't have space there. Mm -hmm. So if government would give us space at that level, I think it would be very good. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the capacity to what? To help our people with money, to help our people with our resources. Mm -hmm. And even if you go there in the name of a minority party, Sometimes you might not make it. Mm. So the time has come for us to have a dialogue. I think there should be a stakeholder dialogue on how government nominates MMDCs mm. so that we all have an input in it. Because if it was a mix of all the parties, then I believe that some of the violence that we are seeing mm. wouldn't have occurred. But, uh, let me ask you a direct question. Mm -hmm. Let's assume they open it for voting and say the CPP decides that you are strong in Medina. Mm -hmm. So instead of putting candidates in all 215, 
you will just focus on the five percent wouldn't that give you a chance to demonstrate your governance capacity at that level so that if somebody living in Tema sees what Medina is doing or say ah if this is how CPP leads in Medina then let's bring them to Tema but in this current state they don't they cannot experience CPP <coughs> except what they remember for Kwame Nkrumah so they may never give you a chance so in, the, in spite of what you said maybe the parties may also want to amend their strategies when this is opened up so people can get to taste your governance you see you are treating me like when i was in the purc <laughs> giving me a context question as it stands now mm. the issue of voting is still in a hang mm -hmm. so in that vacuum what then happens if they give us an opportunity now before we go into the voting sphere at least people would know what we can do because there would be a cpp person for instance in charge of cape coast municipal doing all the work the developmental work that has to be done out of that the people around there would know that if you give the opportunity to the cpp they can work with everything that we have from our antecedents, from Kwame Nkrumah's time, from Dr. Liman's time, all the work that we did. Of course, sometimes people say we are talking about history, but some of our policies and programs are being used by the Diopoli, even though they are unable to do it properly because it doesn't belong to them. So the point here is that if we are given the opportunity, even at this time, before we move into the sphere of voting, then I believe that people will know what we can do. For instance, government can say that for maybe three or four districts, five districts in the western region, across greater Accra, Ashanti region, we are giving it to the Convention's People's Party. And if that is given to us, through consensus, through dialogue, through stakeholder consultation, it is agreed. So that we can also be part of the process. Because as it stands now, we are not there. I think government should consider Okay. including us in the dialogue, including us in the nomination, including us in everything that they do, so that at the end of the day, we can also show our prowess mm -hmm. and what we can do to help the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for uh, Nanaya Jantua. And, and I must say that this is the first major conversation about this since the election. And on this, this program is on about 10 media platforms, and only the CPP is here. So I think we need to commend IDEC for doing this. So in, in spite of the fact that the <laughs> minority parties have been marginalized, at least for starters, the panel here tells you that it's a new thinking. So we will thank God for that, and then we'll do better next time. So thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Akwete. So now, the, there's another thematic, but, but I want to ask uh, Honorable Obi Amos, the Deputy Minister, to just take a seat next to that side. I'm doing this because of the media aesthetics, because I know he'll make some comments. No, no, you be here, I need you. So that when, the, I don't want the cameras to be shifting. In the meantime, we will also take your questions as well. We're making very good for time. We have 6.25, we have 35 minutes to go. So hopefully I'll do five minutes, uh, Mr. Jonah, then we have 30 minutes to go around the table. Um, your area, uh, Mr. Jonah, is quite interesting. It's inclusiveness, in a sense, what Madam Hamida and uh, Madam Nanaya have said are components of inclusiveness. So my general question to you is, you've studied this for many, many years. What are your thoughts around how allowing partisan voting at the local level, what would it mean for the various dimensions of inclusiveness? Because the agenda, they are poverty dimensions, they are whatever. Well, so just your general thoughts on that, Doc, thank you. Yeah, thank you so very much, uh, Bernard. Please check his mic. Uh, yeah, Bernard, thank you so very much. Uh, actually, I would like to take the concerns expressed by my good friend Sabida and Anaya together. What is their concern? Their concern is that the fact of allowing or legalizing local party participation in local government it itself will not improve the condition of women will not enhance the participation of the small parties. Yes, those of us who are advocating the legalization of political party participation in local government are very much aware of this fact. Therefore, what we have done 
is to make very concrete proposals that will enable women to be adequately represented, that will enable the political parties to take their rightful role in the political decision making mm. at the local level. And what are these uh, 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 proposals? In the case of women, we have said that because we checked the statistics and the situation is worse than having, having just said, mm -hmm. I looked at what is called the Global uh, Gender Gap Report. Mm -hmm. And Ghana is 107 for 2021 out of 153 countries ranked. Wow. I looked at the Interparliamentary Union's uh, data on women's representation. And Ghana is number 145 out of 190 countries ranked. Just recently, when His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu, the President, nominated people for the position of Chief Executives, only 38 out of the 260 were women. And we can go on and on and on. Because of this, we proposed that a mixed member proportional representation system, and I will try to, I will do my best to explain, should be introduced at the local government level. What is mixed member proportional representation? It is a combination of the present system that we use to elect our MPs, that we use to elect our assembly members. Mm -hmm. Candidates file and so on and so forth. But if you add onto it the proportional representation, all that it means is that if you had 100 members for an assembly, for example, you can decide that to begin with, I am going to set aside 30 or 40 out of this 100 for women only. Mm -hmm. Whatever is left, 60 or 70, women candidates can contest for those ones as well. Mm -hmm. But to begin with, you already have 30 or 40 percent of the seats reserved for women. Mm. So individual parties contesting will fill their candidates for the 70 or 60 percent, which is on the majoritarian or first part of the post system, mm -hmm. and will fill a list for the 30 or 40 percent that will be for the proportional representation. So at the, at the end of the day, by the time the votes are counted, we are already sure that 30 or 40 percent of women will be elected on the proportional representation and those who were able to contest the other one will also be added onto it. So what it means is that at, at the end of the day, you won't have less than 30 or 40 percent that was set aside for women. And this mixed member proportional representation is something that the EC under Dr. Farijan even recommended at the local level, that's what you're talking about. So we are 100% behind the Affirmative Action Bill, in fact. Um, we organized an event at the Tang Palace Hotel just a few months ago on this matter. We are very, very solidly behind this, but we think that the quickest way of increasing the participation of women, at least at the local level, will be to introduce the mixed member proportional representation system. Mm -hmm. The same applies to the small parties. Right now, the first past the post system, which produces very stable government and so on and so forth, is good for the national level. But when it comes to the local level, mm. and you have such parties that are not financially strong, you need a proportional representation system that will ensure that any party, regardless of how many million dollars they have in the bank account, if they are able to cross a certain threshold, will have some members in the various assemblies. Right now, since 2016, we have not had a single member of any of the minority parties outside parliament in parliament. 2016, we didn't get any. 2020, we thought we were going to get one or two. We didn't get any. But if our mixed member proportional representation system is accepted, it will solve the problem for women at the local level now, Madam Habida Harrison was saying that the parties will be forced to implement the affirmative action law if it is passed. Don't forget that in the present system, there's no party at the local level to be forced. The parties simply don't exist there to be forced. So, actually, 
allowing political parties to go in there will enable the law to force them to put women on their list and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, Bernard, let me just take advantage of the opportunity you've given me to also say something about other people who have not been included in our present local government system, our chiefs. Mm -hmm. Chiefs play such a critical role in the life of the average Ghanaian mm -hmm. that it, before colonialism, these were our presidents. Mm -hmm. These are, were our pre-colonial sovereigns. And because of this, the colonial government in its wisdom said, let me concentrate at the national level and subcontract the local government to the chiefs. So throughout the colonial period, the chiefs were actually the local government. Unfortunately, since independence, we have been marginalizing and marginalizing and marginalizing them until today, on the 1992 constitution, they don't play any major role in local government. The, the, what that is is that 30% of the government appointees, uh, they will be appointed in consultation with the chiefs. If you speak to any chief, privately or publicly, they will tell you that they don't consult us. Hmm. And so, at the moment, the only place for chiefs is on the Council of State, on the Lands Commission, on the um, Regional Coordinating Councils, and you know, they, they feel completely marginalized. And don't forget, this is one of the main reasons why in 2019, they opposed the referendum. Mm. 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 So, we are proposing that it is still possible to give our, people, our chiefs a very important role in local government by setting up a local council for governance and development. Mm -hmm. A local government structure which will be made up of mainly of chiefs, but they should be free to co-opt other professionals, lawyers, doctors, teachers, onto this committee. And this committee would advise would make land available to the local government, will engage in conflict resolution, and so on and so forth. And, and, and we have been making this proposal for very, since 2018 or so, thereabout. Mm -hmm. You know, it is just that people are not aware of it. So wow. this is how we propose to enhance inclusiveness. Mm. In so it's, it's got a local council local, for what? Council for local development and governance. Amazing. It would have been nice to have a chief here to, to pick his thoughts, but this is great. We'll disc we'll, this is live on TV. We're on all GBC stations across, and viewers of GBC will be leaving us in the next seven minutes. So I want to take a couple of comments before they leave. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Jonah. Now, a couple of questions. Could, could you ask a quick question to you? I think your, your, your research has set the cut among the pigeons in a certain way, because we're all very happy that 76% of Ghanaians wanted us to vote. Then the results had through a curveball. I think you said what percentage said they, they didn't want political parties or whatever. No, yeah. So 76% wanted us to vote, but only 20% wanted the voting to be done on partisan basis. So that's like, ah, what's going on here? So what question did you ask them? <laughs> and what does that mean for what we are trying to do? You get me? Because you are the one who framed the question. So please get him a mic. I mean, your people, CDD, or is it Afrobarometer? I need help with the mic, please. So, what, what does that actually mean? Okay, are they opposed to it, or they just don't prefer it, or they didn't understand the question? <laughs> so, Kojo, this is Dr. Kojo Pumpini Asante of CDD. Thank you, and good evening to everybody. Um, no, I think the question has been clear. Um, the question on whether we should vote or continue appointment We've asked this question uh, several times, uh, both through the Afrobarometer surveys, but also uh, CDD surveys, either pre-election surveys or post-election surveys. And what is very clear is that the margin of approval for elections is the highest uh, uh, when we did the last survey, uh, which is now 76%. And then the margin, I think on the partisan issue, the last survey was uh, the 2017 survey, okay. which was almost split between partisan and non-partisan. Okay. Now, our speculation is that after the referendum of 2019, a lot has changed. Mm. And we've seen this sharp movement uh, to 71%, which 
are saying that it's non-partisan. But what was for me insightful was the evaluation of the performance of the local government system. Okay. It is so appalling. Um, everybody says uh, it's not working. not working. So the question that comes is, is it just a simple matter of election, whether partisan or non-partisan? Would partisan election deliver uh, improvement in local government system? Will non-partisan election deliver improvement in local government system? So I think for me, the, the issue that's been put on the table here about the precondition, mm. we need to unpack it mm. and understand it very well. I mean, I take an example from Madam Hamida's uh, um, you know, observation about the performance of women at the local government level. I mean, it's counterintuitive. You would think that at the local government level, in terms of the transaction cost of putting yourself out, standing and contesting for election, there should be more people that are able to uh, get the opportunity, particularly women. Yes, just looking at the, the population uh, 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 statistics. And yet, it is worse at local government level than national level. Meanwhile, you require more money you know, uh, to get to uh, parliament. Yeah. So what is going on there? And remember that this is a non-partisan system, uh, officially. So there is a lot to unpack to understand mm -hmm. what the cause and effect is. So that if we have an opportunity to reform this local government system, which I believe for me will transform Ghana's democracy, mm. we have to take our time to frame the problem okay. and understand the, the, the sequencing so that whatever we introduce would actually get to the outcome, which is better service delivery and local, and local democracy mm. uh, at so the local level. So does CDD believe that this is the time for this conversation? I, this is, this has been the time for so, much, <laughs> so long. Mm. I think even what is, what is imperative mm. is that people are getting fatigued yeah. with the democracy project mm -hmm. because we're still struggling to deliver on development. Mm. And if the people don't get some other hope or some injection you know, to believe that this project will still work, mm -hmm. I think give it 10 years, we'll have real problems. So reform has to happen somewhere. And I think for me, in local democracy or really looking at the local level, because if the problem is development, which is what everybody's saying, if you can address it at local level, you're already uh, uh, towards, you know, moving towards uh, wow. the answer. So for me, I think it's not just a simple question of election. It's mm. would election deliver development? Mm. And how do we ensure that? Thank you very much, Koju Asante. Please hand the mic. So we want to say thank you to our viewers on Ghana Television, and you, they, they are crossing over to a different program. But we're still live on City. We're live on Joy. We're live on Atinka, and we are also partnered by The Graphic, UTV, TV3, uh, GNA, Asasi Radio, and Radio Gold. So this is a national conversation. So you can still smile. You are still on TV. So it's, GBC is gone, but we are still here. So you can still be happy. Um, by the way, this is a quick announcement. If you are the owner of a Volvo, which is white, you've blocked the GBC people. If you don't move your car, they can't go. So if you don't want them to go, then you sit here by. But honestly speaking, GR848520. Volvo, please move your car now, otherwise GBC cannot go. So uh, my question to you, so in 2019, when all this was going on and MPP wanted us to bring multi-partisanship into this, it was all well and good. But I, I, I sense that the parliamentary outcome of the election shocked you a bit. Because it's now 50-50. And if our assemblies are so, all sort of coterminous with our parliamentary seats, it means that if we had done what you wanted, half of our MMDCs would possibly be headed by NDC people. So my question to you is that your position still hasn't changed, despite that reality of the election result. So how do you deal practically with, so Adenta, we are Babuya Samoa, now Ramadan is the M MP, so possibly somebody from NDC would have been the MC. So with things like 1D1F, 
the president is doing a tour of Greater Accra region, would he still go and hold the MCE's hand and say, this is my corn factory? Or he would just select the MPP? <laughs> the MPP play. How, how, how would this thing work in practice? Because your foot soldiers do are not happy because they said somebody undermined YB, he lost the election. But uh, now his MCE, executive power is for NDC. And we have an executive president who is MPP. And you are local government minister. How will you just give us comfort to understand that it's not such a big problem as I'm making it seem? So explain how that will work for me. Well, thank you so much. I must commend IDEC for this conversation. Indeed, as far back as August 2017, I was here to talk about this same process. We've moved on, we went very far, and we even had the CI for the referendum, which never took place. Now, if asked a very good question, what we must appreciate is that even with the MPP, some didn't want this process. Okay. Because obviously, is we not taking all, and now you're saying that we should share power. So those in power felt that, why do we have to share power when we are in power? Mm. But we, the president was very insistent. The president was focused. The president said that this is not the only country practicing this. Mm -hmm. Across the world, even in Africa, you have such situations. And when you attend conferences, sometimes they wonder that you've gone very far as far as democracy is concerned. How come you still appoint your chief executives instead of going through the electoral process? Mm. So it, we, we should not just say that it's only one side or when you are in opposition that you want it, when you are in power, you don't want it. It cuts across. And the reality is that you will have to give to be able to take. Mm. Obviously, the president in championing this is aware that if you open up, he's not going to get 260 plus one. Now we've added one this way to it, 260 plus one, all being from his party. We will share power. Mm -hmm. And if the Accra mayor is from one party, but the president from another party, we move on. Mm. That, that, indeed, that doesn't mean that if you have government policies, you cannot take credit for government policies. Mm. You cannot champion government policies. Some may even come along because they think that's a good policy. Mm -hmm. If you achieve executive of a district and one D1F is doing very well mm. and you don't want to associate yourself with it, then it means you want a short term in office. Mm. So obviously, uh, we have to learn mm. how to manage this. Other countries have done it and we should be able to do it. But moving forward, I think the point which has been made here is that probably we should put out the reforms before we talk about this okay. election. Okay. It shouldn't be just about election and then some saying yes, some saying no. Okay. What are the reforms? Mm. For us at the ministry, we appreciate this. And we have the National Decentralization Policy and Strategy 2020-2024. They contain all these things, affirmative, affirmative action, uh, getting the minority on board, making sure that some strategies are put in place mm. so that we really talk about decentralization. Now, if we were able to build a consensus, right from 2017, we were sure that we needed a consensus. Mm. Some of the hurdles um, which we, we really envisaged included this issue of whether one party would not think that in allowing us to carry out the reforms, we would not take advantage and then look more popular than them. Um, we worked very well at the parliamentary level. You could see that we had strong advocates from both sides mm. as to the way forward. Somehow, at the last moment, um, we saw that our colleagues on the other side felt that we should go back to the original situation. Mm. They didn't understand why, at the district level, we should introduce multi-party mm -hmm. democracy, which is a bit strange because if you, you are a party, they should be the first to advocate for multi-party at every level. We've moved on. We are hoping that this platform Mm. Would, would, would give us the opportunity to carry on mm. and bring everybody on board. Quick question for you. How, what lessons can we draw from the new regions? Because 
that initially to us in the media seemed very difficult. Yeah. But somehow you managed to get everybody to think it was a good idea and we didn't see any opposition from any, any major opposition. Yes. So Ob can we draw any lessons from there for this one? Yeah, obviously the major issue was the fact that if you were anti-region, Mm -hmm. You were putting yourself in trouble mm. because most of the people wanted new regions. Mm. So if, if you didn't want it, initially some wanted to campaign against it, mm -hmm. and they saw that they had to come on board mm. because most people wanted new regions. Okay. They had some had came for the regions for decades, and they okay. didn't have it. Mm -hmm. So that helped. When it came to election of MMDCs, we seemed to be going along very well until mm. um, our friends came in and said that. Mm. Um, multi-party democracy at that level would so destroy based on, everything. Based on what you said, isn't it better, Doc, to go bottom up? Because if the parties realize that if we go against a new region, we'll lose on the ground. If you go on the ground and the sentiment is that yeah. let's do it on a multi-partisan basis, then the parties will align. Because at the top, the parties have interest, which may not necessarily coincide with what they put one from the bottom. So maybe a lot of their work should be aimed at find out what the people on the ground actually want. And if that's what they want, the party can, cannot say they won't do it. Yes, but if you listen to our good friend here, the survey shows that now more people want us to elect our chief executives, but far less think that it should be non-partisan, which is unfortunate, because then you, you end up with one party state. As we speak, it's only one party nominating people, endorsing people to run their districts. And if you say you don't want multi-party, that mm. means when a government comes to power, that government then has the monopoly to choose everybody, and it's worse than bringing in other parties to mm. also test their strength and take over. Okay. So probably we need to bring out the issues well and convince people more. But we also must appreciate that there was so much damage caused by certain civil society organizations. Mm. Yes, about this whole referendum thing. It really? got to a point, people were very vociferous about the fact that we should introduce multi-party at the local level. Okay. And that might have shaped the minds, the, of, the minds of those who are now responding that right. uh, multi-party is so bad at the top, Fantastic. don't bring it down. Which Thank is, you. Which is so uh, I'm coming to the floor now, but I want you to help me when we close with the preconditions. Because I think where we've got into knowing what has to be done and for all of us to spell that out to be great. So, Doc, that will be my last assignment for you. But I want to open the floor for any questions or comments. I see uh, Dr. Asante from ISE. Uh, is Dr. Fiadumo here? I, I see a few people around. Um, I see um, Mrs. Kwe Appinting from EU. If you, if, are there any questions or comments? Can I get a mic, please? Or are the, are the issues clear from this side? Yes, sir. My name is George Aparado. I'm the National Youth Organizer for the NDC. Oh, and I'm a two-term Municipal Chief Executive. Because of the mass, I didn't see I understand. You. Forgive me. Honorable, I understand. Um, Pablo. I believe that a lot of things have been said, and a lot of mistakes too have been made. Okay. Um, most of your participants are not participants at the local level. Mm -hmm. They are not practitioners. So okay. I can understand some of the assumptions they have come out with. For instance, when Mr. Kwesijo and I were speaking, he said chiefs were not, or chiefs are not consulted. I saw Obi Awan look at me and I looked at him and we all laughed. That is not entirely true. Mm, mm. Because chiefs are active participants at the local level. Mm -hmm. And most often, they are consulted. Okay. I am yet to see any district assembly in this country that does not have representation from the chieftains and institutions within the localities. They will not even agree. The difficulty with election of MMDCs, and I side with what CDD is saying, the truth is that unless we do a lot more education, because what we have currently, mm -hmm. and we call decentralization, is not decentralization. Okay. And so if the people are still not interested and are not seeing much, it is because of how we've operated in the last, from 1987 up to date. Power still sits at the top. Chief executives don't have the power to do anything. I was there for eight years, and 80% of the decisions are taken in Accra. Honorable Lobi Awan here will bear me witness. You don't have, <laughs> no, because he's been an MP, and okay. he's an MP, and he knows, you want to put him in trouble. No, he, he knows what happens. For instance, the common fund. Yes, sir. That should be going to the district assemblies. 60% of the expenditure, it's done here in Accra. At the top. 
So before the money even gets to you, it's been expended. So really, there is no power, there is no authority for the district chief executive. If you look at education, education comes directly mm -hmm. under the districts. Mm -hmm. But no district chief executive can even call the district director of education and instruct him because there will be counter instructions from the Ministry of Education. Mm. So until we build stronger institutions, until we have a national development plan properly in place, mm. until our institutions are truly independent, we cannot elect municipal chief executive. Mm. And that is what the reality is. Because you mm. end up electing him, and on what rules, what grounds, what basis is he going to operate? I have a question for you. You know, we had gender, the other parties and other dimensions, we didn't really think about youth. And I'm grateful you are here because you're a youth organizer. What is your sense from the youth within your party about this? Because I know you talk to them, you travel around. Well, just give us some, because I'm sure the youth also feel marginalized in the process, right? So what are your thoughts about what the youth would say if you went back to them with these proposals? The party I belong to give a lot of opportunities to young people. I was 26 years old when I was appointed chief executive. So. Um, a lot of young people have aspirations within the NDC. They believe that the NDC gives opportunity to young people. The reality is that if we decide to elect chief executives, then we must have, like um, Dr. Akwete said, an institution or a political organization that will solely be responsible for growing political parties mm. and also mm. not just women groups being brought on board, but then some budgetary allocation to support young people who want to venture into politics. Because that is expensive, it's an expensive venture. So if you don't have the opportunity of a government appointing you or bringing you in, very few young people contest primaries and win. Mm. And if it is going to be based on party lines, then there'll be primaries as well. Mm. So you have to contest the primaries and win to contest as a chief executive on the ticket of any other political party. And that is going to be So it may even be worse it, if it will the be, it will conditions... Be worse. It will be worse. Wow. Until we meet the conditions that are equitable. Yeah, these these conditions about. are serious, but we have, we have to go through the conditions again. So I'm done. Thank no, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Please. That was George Opariado. He's the national youth organizer of the NDC. Thank you so much for. I didn't see you because of the mask. We have another comment here. Uh, we are still live on air. Please identify yourself and yeah. then go straight. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Nicholas Awache. I'm the director of the Institute of Local Government Studies. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a, a number of comments um, and questions. But first, let me tackle the issue of the preconditions. Yeah. Um, I've been listening to Dr. Akote on this. Um, it looks like we can never then uh, allow political parties to participate. Because if you have to get the regulatory environment you know, to, to say to be perfect, or at least to be enabling, uh, you must as well set the same standard for the national level. Mm -hmm. Because why is it that when you want to introduce multi-party at the local level, then the standard must be high. Mm. That the, the regulatory framework must be high. That the police should be able to arrest overpayment or corruption and other things before we can introduce local level. Why do we set that standard? If you look at global, global, and we don't have to make it look dangerous in, in our environment. Globally, in Africa, Ghana is the only country where multi-party is done at the national level and non-partisan at the local level. Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to my Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Super